Church of Lexington. How's everybody doing? It's good to have you here. We are going to be in the book of Judges this morning, Old Testament book. It's a historical book. It is um, it's a difficult book, a difficult time in Israel's history. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for, your, for what we've experienced in worship. I pray that your spirit continue to open up our eyes and our hearts and our ears to see and to hear what you have to say through your word and to uh, have courage to have faith in you, in your name. Amen. All right. These, um, these stories are hard on a preaching day because there's a lot of material to cover quickly. And we, um, we're going to talk about Gideon today from the book of Judges. And the purpose of the book of Judges is ultimately to show us that no matter how we might miss the mark, God will be faithful to himself and to us as his people. And so each judge's story is woven together to create a single message designed to give us the courage to trust God in our own personal journey and to let him rule over our hearts and circumstances and give us hope. So we call these people in, in the book of Judges judges, but what they are is they're military rulers they're saviors and deliverers, and we have a definition of what a judge is in Judges chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. But the judge's ministry of deliverance was intended to be a catalyst for the Israelites for godly living. So Israel cries out to God, and God shows him that he heard them and that he cares about their lives and troubles by delivering them from their oppressors. Israel, in turn, was to submit to God's rule and let him rule over their lives. So this is what we have with Jesus as well, right? Jesus comes to earth. He comes to earth as our deliverer, our redeemer, and he's here, and he delivers us from sin and death and hell. And our response is to then turn to him and let him rule over our lives. And this is what the book of Judges is about as well. Each judge symbolizes an aspect of Israel, a weakness in Israel, actually. And each story, which is held together by four main judges, Barak, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson. The, each story reveals a new aspect to Israel's relationship with Yahweh. These men are progressively negative examples of faith going from bad to worse, so that we have Barak being pretty obedient, Gideon being pretty obedient but having some more difficulties, Jephthah being pretty clueless, Samson to just being in your face self-indulgent. I know we talk about these people as heroes of the faith. They are heroes of the faith. Hebrews lists them in, the, in, uh, in chapter 11 as men of faith. They are men of faith. They are flawed men. And we are supposed to take a look at their lives and see what it says about God and what God is telling us about who he is and how he expects us to respond. Because these men are just like us, flawed. And when we look at these stories, we need to remember that the main character in these stories is not the judge. So we're going to talk about Gideon a lot today, but Gideon is not the main character of the story. God is the main character of the story. In the ancient world, they didn't write things down because they didn't have the means. Um, and the New, the New Testament manuscripts that we have are all written in all caps, no spaces, because it conserves paper, and paper was precious and wasn't readily available. And the ancient world taught through stories, things that you could remember and you could learn from remembering the story. Where we get tripped up in America is that, first of all, we don't learn from stories. Second of all, we have a tendency to kind of dumb these things down to like Aesop's fables or something like that, where we're looking for the moral of the story. So if you're looking for the moral of Gideon's story, you're going to miss what God is saying in this story. 
This is not, well, Gideon did this, so the moral of the story is don't do this. You go that route, and you've missed what's going on. You've missed what God is trying to say about himself and how he wants us to respond to him. So if we, if we look at the moral of the story, we take our focus off of God and place it on the secondary characters, the humans, and it causes us to miss what God is saying. And the reason we need the book of Judges and this message about Gideon is that we have a tendency to want to rule over ourselves. This is found in the refrain of this book. This book has a refrain that's repeated four times throughout the book in strategic places. And the refrain is this, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what they wanted to do. And the conclusion is something that Gideon is going to say, but the conclusion of the matter should be that there is no king in Israel. It needs to be God, not, and I will do what is right in my own eyes. But this then is the problem. And we are under construction, right? This is, this, is the, uh, this is the theme of the stage. It's been the theme of the last few messages. We've talked about pride. We've talked about patience in difficult circumstances. We've talked about controlling your tongue. What we're going to talk about today is foundational to being constructed into a mature Christian. It's foundational. If you're going to, if you're going to push down your pride, you're going to need this. If you're going to be able to wait patiently in circumstances for God to work, you're going to need what we're talking about today. If you need to control your tongue, you're going to need this in order to do it. You're going to need what we're talking about today. This is a foundational Christian character that God want, character trait that God wants to build up in us and construct in us as a foundation for our lives. And that foundation character trait is faith. Now, I'm not talking about faith in terms of I believe in Jesus' faith. That's the way we talk about it a lot of times. That's included. But I want us to focus on faith as trust in God and who he is and in his character. We need to trust God for who he is and, in his, and we need to trust in his character so that he may build us up and that we may be people of faith who do not rule ourselves, but allow God to rule over us. And so we're under construction for the purpose of gaining maturity as believers. And this is a lifelong process. And sometimes it hurts. You can't put together a building without hammering a few nails. But we are being constructed to be mature believers parts of God's family so that we are able to fulfill our purpose to shine the light of God to those around us in a ministry of reconciliation to God, of God to people. And this is what we're called to do. It's what we've been called to do since Genesis chapter 1. And so we have three chapters. Gideon's story is three chapters. And what I've done is I've condensed this. And we're going to bounce a little around a little bit if you follow along. We're in chapters 6 through 9, but we need to get part of the story. We need to have a good grasp of the story. This is what it's teaching us. I'll talk about some of the more famous things, which we're not going to read um, when, um, in a little bit here. But this is going to be chapters 6 through 9 condensed so we can get the story. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hand of the Midianites. So Midian impoverished the Israelites that they, so much that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, I rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hands of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you 
have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, Lord, Gideon said, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out, out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So we're going to skip a lot of the famous part. We'll talk about it. Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again during Gideon's lifetime, and the land had peace for 40 years. And the Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, your sons, your grandsons, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. And they answered, We will be glad to give them. So they spread a garment, and each of them threw a ring from it, from his plunder into it. And Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. And all Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family as well. Jerob Baal, son of Joash, this is Gideon. He was given this nickname, and we'll talk about it uh, in a little bit. But Jerob Baal, or Gideon, went back to his home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, a son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father, Joash, and Oprah of the Abizrites. And no sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Barit as their God and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things that he had done for them. And Abimelech, son of Jerobaal, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them and all his mother's clans, Ask the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you, to have all of 70 of Jerobaal's sons rule over you or just one man? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. And they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berit, and Abimelech used it to hire reckless scoundrels, scoundrels who became his followers. He went to his father's home in Ophrah, and in one stone murdered his 70 brothers, the sons of Jerobaal. After Abimelech had governed Israel three years, God stirred up animosity between Abimelech and the citizens of Shem, uh, Shechem so that they acted treacherously against Abimelech. And God did this in order that the crime against Jerobaal's 70 sons and the shedding of their blood might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and on the citizens of Shechem who had helped him murder his brothers. And Abimelech attacked Shechem until he captured it and killed all its people. And then he destroyed the city and scattered salt over it. And Abimelech went to Thebes and besieged it and captured it. Inside the city, however, there was a strong tower to which all men and women, all the people of the city had fled. And they had locked themselves in and climbed to the roof. Abimelech went to the tower to, and attacked it. But as he approached the entrance of the tower to set it on fire, a woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull. And when the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. 
unless God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. And God also made the people of Shechem pay for their wickedness. The curse of Jotham, son of Jeroboam, came on them. So we have the story of Gideon and his son Abimelech. We can't talk about Gideon without talking about his son. I believe we have this passage here because sometimes we think that God is pleased with us just because he helps us out or he uses us to do things or he encourages us in our circumstances. That does not mean that God is pleased with us. But it's easy for us to think that when God is helping us and by our side. And the story of Gideon is to tell us that God will never leave us. He will never leave his people. But he still expects us to trust him in faith. God expects us to trust him. He won't leave us, but he expects us to trust him in faith. And in this story of Gideon, we have three gifts of grace that God gives, gave Israel and gives us so that we learn to trust him in all things and we learn to have him rule over us as king and lord in all situations. The first thing that we can see is that God gives us the gift of encouragement to prove that he will not leave us but to show us that he still expects us to have faith in him and to trust him. Gideon got signs and encouragement everywhere, right? All over the place. We skipped over the most famous parts of the story. We're going to come back to it here. So, the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon, and he says, I want you to go and attack the Midianites. And Gideon doesn't know what to do about it. He has these questions, but he says, look, look, I want to confirm that it's you. Uh, I want to confirm that you're speaking to me, so let me go get a, uh, an offering. I'll come back, and we'll have supper together. Gideon brings the offering back. The angel, who is the angel of the Lord, God in the flesh, um, in, in flesh appearing at least at this time, touches the offering. It's burnt up. Gideon realizes he's seen God face to face. And he's given this encouragement, it is I, it is Yahweh who have asked you to do this. I will empower you. I am sending you, right? Isn't that what he said? I'm sending you. Go get it done. So he gives Gideon this encouragement, and then he asks him to do something. It's followed by an act of faith. So Gideon says, here's the, uh, the Lord says, here's the encouragement. I'm with you. This is me. You've seen me. You know it's me now. So I want you to go, I want you to break down the altar to Baal, and I want you to build an altar to me in its place, take the second bull out of your father's herd, and sacrifice it on this altar. And Gideon does it. He does it. He acts in faith. He comes to this crisis of faith, and he does what he's supposed to do. Now, he does it at night, so nobody sees, but they wake up in the morning, and they say, hey, What's this altar here? Where's Baal's altar? Altar. He destroyed. Who destroyed Baal's altar? They should die. And Gideon's father stands up and says, "Look, this. You know, this is God's people. An altar, a proper altar to the Lord, was just set up with a proper sacrifice. And God's people are going, what the heck? Kill this guy. Our our society." Our culture has been ruined. The one that we set up, it's destroyed. Gideon's father stands up and he says, Look, we're God's people. If Baal's so great, let Baal deal with Gideon. And so they named him Jerob Baal, which means let he who contends contend with Baal. So that, that's where he gets his nickname. And then God tells Gideon again, I need you to attack the Midianites. Gideon says, okay, this is the part we all know, right? All right, all right, I, I, just, just entertain me here, God. I'm going to put a fleece out. I want the fleece to be wet and the, dry to be ground, or the ground to be dry, okay? Let's do that, and then I'll know it's you. 
So God does it. Gideon comes out. He goes, awesome. Let's try this again. I'm not really sure. Let's do it again. I want the fleece dry this time and the ground wet. And God does it. And then Gideon is given a crisis of faith. So he's given an army to go attack the Midianites. And God says, okay, here's, here's, you got too many people here. If you go out and win with this many people, you're going to think that you did it on your own. Now, the odds were bad to begin with. You're talking about, about 135,000 of the Midianites and about 32,000 Israelites. Still not really good odds. But God says, nope, we're thinning the crowd out because you're too arrogant. You're going to think you did this. So he gives them 300 men. There's the crisis of faith. Am I going to go to battle with 300 men? Really? And we're going to be armed with jars and trumpets? No, oh, this is going to go well. But Gideon does it. He does it. He goes out there, and they're ready to, they're ready to start. And God says to Gideon, you know, I know you're nervous about this. I can understand. I'm going to give you some more encouragement. Go down to the camp with your servant and, um, and just to see what happens. So they go to the camp. He and his servant go to the pan- camp. They hear some guy saying, I had a dream last night. This big, this big loaf of bread that wasn't gluten-free came down and knocked over the tent. And, the, um, and the, the, uh, the, uh, his companion says, oh, this has got to be Gideon. He's going to destroy us. So Gideon and his servant go back. They go. He gets his encouragement. Now he actually has to go to battle, and he does it, and he's victorious. So God gives Gideon this encouragement over and over again. And each, each time of encouragement, Gideon is expected to exercise faith in a practical way. God just doesn't encourage him and encourage him and encourage him. Each step, here's your encouragement. This is the step you need to take in your life. Here's your encouragement. This is the step you need to take in your life. And Gideon does this. But he's still not ready to have God rule over him. God encouraged him with these signs and the success, but he was still unable to trust God in faith to rule over him. And we know this is true because of the ephod, right? He says the right things. He says, hey, they come to him. They say, hey, be king over us. He says, I'm not going to be king. God should be your king. Right answer. That's exactly the, the conclusion the whole book wants us to get. God should be king. It shouldn't be there is no king in Israel. Everyone did what they want. It should be the king in Israel is God, Yahweh, and we have given up ourselves to him to rule over us. But it's not the case. God expects him to trust us. God expects us to trust him for who he is. The point of the encouragement was to turn Gideon fully to God. But God expects us to be obedient and to trust him for who he is, not because of what he does for us. And this is what you would miss if you made this, the moral of the story is, Gideon did this, so I should do this. Stable, mature relationship with God is rooted in trust and not reward. God expects us to act on who he is. And this is what the encouragement is designed to do. Here's the encouragement. You see, I'm faithful. I'm good. Okay, here's the encouragement. You see, I'm just. I'm righteous. Here's the encouragement. You see, I can take care of you. I'm sovereign. I'm in control of things. And so that when it comes time, we then, when we get in a situation where we come across something in our life, our first response is, I trust God. It's a hard place to get to. This is why it requires construction, sawing some wood, hammering some nails. But this is exactly what God is getting at here. So I used to coach volleyball, and, um, 
And so one of, one of the skill sets that, that has to be automatic is when you're reaching for a ball, you have to be able to reach for it so that you don't get penalized. And so um, in volleyball, if your hands are together like this, you're pretty good. Okay, but if you're reaching, you can reach further if you don't have your hands locked together. The natural reaction is to reach like this. So if you reach like this and the ball hits here, you're done. That's a carry. It's a penalty. You've lost the point. Doesn't matter whether you actually carried it. If it hits that open palm, that's it. And so what we would do is I would try, I'd talk, we'd work on this with the girls. Your hand goes like this. You reach for the ball, your hand bounces off the back of your hand. That's never, ever going to be a carry. So one of your teammates bumps it. It goes sideways a little bit. It's getting ready to go out of bounds. You need to get it over the net. Hand out. Boom. And we work on it every single day. Reach for it. No, not like this. Like this. Encouragement. Encouragement. Reach like this. Encouragement. You can do this. You can get it done. Three weeks. Three weeks later, we're still working on it every day. And we get into a game, and lo and behold, nobody has to think about anything. They're not reaching for the ball like this, which is natural. They're reaching for the ball like this. No carry. They could keep the thing alive. This is what God does when he encourages us. He wants us to come to the place where it's just automatic. I don't have plan A, which is my plan, and plan B, which is God's plan, when my plan fails. I don't rest in my work ability to get this done. I can get through this. I surrender my thoughts and my plans to God in the everyday life. And so God is building us so that we have a faith that operates out of us as a natural reaction because he has built into us and constructed us to have faith. And he does this by giving us encouragement, encouragement. And the point is, when we look back on our history, God did this, God did this, God did this, God did this. If we say, God did this, and it came out good, God did this, and it came out good, God did this, and it came out good, we get into our new situation, and we go, I'm not really sure this can come out good. And we've already lost it, right? Because the focus is not whether this comes out or not. The focus is that God is who he is. And that's why I put my trust in him. Like we talked about with James a couple weeks ago, right? Outcomes are not, the, are not the source of our vision. Our vision is becoming faithful people of God, mature in Christ. So God gives us the gift of encouragement. God gives us the gift of deliverance and help to prove that he will never leave us and show us he still expects us to trust him in faith. Gideon was unable to trust God, and he ended up setting up this ephod that became a snare to all of Israel and to him and his family. And it took them away from God because after all the victory and all the help, he still couldn't release himself to be ruled by God, and neither could Israel. They were unable to trust God. They gave in to the surrounding culture and worshipped the gods that were around them. They defended the surrounding culture, right? Baal's altar's torn down. What are you doing? Building God's altar there. They defended the surrounding culture. They were full of self-pride and reliance. That's why they had to have 300 soldiers, because it took that kind of disparity for them to realize the strength is not theirs. They frustrated God's plan. They desired an illegitimate king by making, trying to make Gideon king over them. And they used God, right? They used him because when it was all over and Gideon was dead, they went back to what they were familiar with. And they used him. They just couldn't find it in themselves to have faith, to trust God. And the point of the deliverance that they received, the deliverance from Midian, the, these people that were crushing them and forcing them to live in caves and forcing them to, to hide their food, these people, were, they were delivered from all of this. And as soon as they were able, they left God. 
And this whole deliverance was designed to turn them to the Lord. We do this. Uh, we, I mean, we've, we have all, those of us that have kids, we have all bailed out our children, right? We've all bailed out our children. We are still bailing out our children. Uh, they are out of the house, but not out of our pockets. And, um, and we are still bailing them out and happy to do so. But when we bail out our children, we expect them to learn, right? Right? So, okay, I got you out of this mess. I hope you've learned your lesson. Right? Okay, I got you out of this mess. You need to get it together. Learn your lesson. Change what you're doing. It's not working. Okay, I'm going to bail you out again. Got to change here. Right? That's what we expect as parents. God expects the same thing. When he delivers us, he doesn't want us to have the attitude that's easy to have, and most, most times it's what we do have, right? Whew, got out of that. Thank you, Lord. And we're on our merry way with no reflection about how we got there and what God is teaching us and how he wants us to be different and how our character needs to change and how we need to learn to trust him. So that's, what the, desi that's the design of the deliverance. It's not to change. The primary design is not to change our situation. The primary design of this is to show us that God is good and he's worthy to trust and he's, he will be good if you let him take control. That's the purpose of getting bailed out. So the, when God delivers us, we should change our behavior and take another step in faith and let God change who we are, a piece, small step at a time. And that's what it is, right? That's what life is. It does, you don't go through these things and all of a sudden you have faith forever, you know. It's, it's, well, I got faith and it got me through the next day and now it's crumbling. I need a little more help. But I'm working on it. We're moving forward. That's okay. That's what, that's what life is is like, and that's what it should be like living with God, is we are learning to put down and destroy our sin nature and to become people who shine the light of God. So God gives us encouragement. He gives us deliverance and help, and he gives us justice and vindication to prove that he will never leave us and show us that he still expects us to trust in him in faith. Gideon's legacy is his son Abimelech. That's his legacy. It's a legacy of violence and death and destruction. And that is what his legacy is going to be unless God intervenes. And uh, yesterday we had a couples, week, uh, couples conference. It was very good. And this, this is how we ended the couples conference. What is the legacy of our marriage? Is our, our, is our marriage relationship going to have a positive legacy or a negative legacy? That is something that is within our control under the spirit and power of God. And so God will give us justice and vindication to encourage us to trust him so that our legacy is pos uh, positive. Despite Gideon telling Israel he would not rule nor his sons would rule over them, Gideon lived like a king anyway. And this is very important to understanding what's going on in Israel and in Gideon's life here. He says, no, God's going to rule over you. But we have a description of Gideon's life, right? Gideon has many wives. Kings, only kings have many wives, okay? That's something that a king has, is many wives. He has many sons, 70. Hopefully he had a few less wives than sons. That would just be a difficult household. Um, 70 sons and a bunch of wives, and he's still got a side gig in another town. And he has a son with this woman too. This is how kings live. And you should not miss this. In the Hebrew, Abimelech 
what Gideon named his son means my dad is the king. He still had not figured out how to let God rule over them. And so God, so Abimelech, whose dad is the king, creates a mess, and God cleans it up. And he judges Abimelech for ruining his dad's heritage and legacy. He judges the, the people that helped him and the city that helped him. So he cleans it up. He preserves Gideon's faithful acts and preserves Gideon's family. One son escaped, and he saw that his dad's legacy was righted and received justice. And now we have it preserved for us. And God gives us this gift to let us know that he's worth trusting. He will vindicate us if we trust him. So I got a video here. This is probably how we understand vindica vindication in a modern sense. Hey, sweetie, I'm not seeing the life jackets. Well, you should. You packed them. No, you packed them. No, you packed them. You said I won't forget to pack I the life jackets. I won't forget to pack the life jacket. I, I'm sorry. I have to. I have to challenge that. Well, you do have one left, so. This What Really Happened replay is brought to you by Progressive. One thing no one would challenge, protecting your home and auto with Progressive. You know, my favorite part was when you said, obviously, I won't forget to bring the life jackets. Did you eat the last of the pretzels? All right. So there's vindication, right? She got her vindication. They did the instant replay. That would cause a lot of trouble and <laughs> if it could be real, right? <laughs> uh, but... So she does the instant replay. Now, what we're not supposed to have is the attitude, I told you so. God is giving us as a gift when we get vindication and justice to let us know that he's worth trusting, that he's good, he's kind, and he's trustworthy, and he will not leave his people. But he expects us to have faith in him. And this isn't, gee, I hope you have faith. This is an expectation. He is expecting this to be done. He is requiring this to be done, if you will. Um, God loves us, and he understands our struggles. And he wants us to release those things to him. He's worthy for faith. He'll prove it to you. And he wants us to construct our lives under his kingship and lordship so that when we're driving to Walmart, he's lord over our attitudes. When we're yelling at the kids, he's lord over our actions and our heart. When we're going to work, he's Lord over our attitude and our work ethic. He wants us to live as people of faith who trust him enough to give over everything. That's a process. And he will encourage us, and he will bail us out, and he will vindicate us from time to time. But there are going to be opportunities 
to show that we've gained this faith. There'll be these times of faith crisis where we will need to act after we've been encouraged or delivered to show ourselves and the God who loves us with the life of his son that we're growing in this faith. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are good and that and that you're patient with us and you help us when we struggle. And you encourage us when we doubt. And you deliver us when we're in trouble. We know that you are the one who makes a way where there doesn't seem to be any way at all. Give us the courage to submit ourselves to your lordship and your kingship. that we might be a people of faith who shine your light and your glory and reflect your character. In your name, amen. Stand with us, please. We continue to worship. <clears throat>